President Markula, first Vice President Timmermans, members of European Parliament, mayors, distinguished guests. First of all, I would like to thank you for your invitation. Eurocities has played a vital role for many years in trying to bring the European Union to closer to its citizens. And that objective has never been more relevant than it is today. Populism is a powerful phenomenon, and Euroscepticism is undoubtedly a force to be reckoned with. The political horizon of a growing number of the world's citizens, spurred by feelings of uncertainty, fear, and inequality, has shifted. They, and make no mistake, amongst them are many Europeans, they are being persuaded to believe that on pan-European problems, homespun national responses are more effective than European solutions. This has fueled the re-emergence of extreme nationalism, protectionism, xenophobia, and geopolitical tensions leading to citizen detachment. Some political earthquakes in 2016, and Brexit in particular, have conditioned some people into thinking that we will be overwhelmed by a populist tidal wave no matter what we do. This is not the case, and we must take great care not to fall into a negative mindset. I'm as much of a realist as the rest of you. I appreciate the challenges Europe is facing, especially this year in the light of elections in France, Germany, and the Netherlands. I also appreciate the suffering endured by many Europeans in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. I understand the desperation they have felt and the disgruntlement they have expressed. This is something we must all understand. Yet I feel, and feel very strongly, that we should face the many challenges before us and work to turn the tide in our favor, then be overwhelmed by it. Talk of an existential crisis within the European Union has become an accepted norm. And yes, it would be a huge mistake for the Union to underestimate the size of the challenge that lies before us. However, it would be an even bigger mistake to resign ourselves to doing nothing. Yes, we are living in extraordinary times, but rather than be disheartened, our duty is to come up with exceptional reaction. Extraordinary times call for extraordinary collective efforts of vision, leadership, and unity. Europe has shown on several occasions in the past that it is capable of doing this, and it can do so again. The Union has achieved great things when leaders have stood together in a spirit of compromise and when they responded to major challenges like the ones we face today. United we stand, because divided we will fall. We must focus on the raison d'etre of the Union, which is the, to bring peace and prosperity to the people, the 500 million citizens who are the living, breathing manifestation of Europe. A union where the existence of the whole is more beneficial than the sum of its parts. Individually, most member states would become more and more irrelevant in a global scenario. If we truly care about the European project, we must listen to what our citizens are telling us. However, merely listening is not enough. We must also have the vision and will to act, and to act quickly to ensure that we eliminate the deficit that exists between decisions being taken and the implementation of those decisions on the ground, which is where they really matter. We must endure and ensure every member state pursues and implements tried and tested benchmarks. Key to this process is agreeing the concept for Europe's future in a changed world, recognizing that the Union has a role in a shaping globalization, not merely reacting to globalization, and agreeing on the fundamentals of a sustainable and a viable Union, without allowing external factors to derail us from our overarching priorities and strategic agenda. The most prominent external factor before us today is Brexit which we must handle in a speedy, effective, and unemotional manner from the moment the UK triggers Article 50. 
there can be no procrastination and certainly no turning back. That would not be in anyone's interest. And throughout the process, the 27 members of the European Union must remain united and never lose sight of the bigger the picture. We need a Europe that practices its long-held principles of solidarity and responsibility on migration. Our citizens deserve to live in a Europe that is socially inclusive, just and strives to narrow, to narrow the gap in equalities, financial or otherwise. We need a Europe that compete, completes its internal single market, which is the most effective motor and catalyst for jobs and growth. A Europe that works harder to create a healthy and sustainable environment and promotes measures to combat climate change. Also key to this vision is securing the future of Europe's finances. We need to rethink what, will prior, what we will prioritize in our financial framework what resources we put in various policies, and what we can do differently. Any plan for the future for Europe needs to address citizens' concerns on their safety and security, while at the same time ensuring that the rights, rule of law, and core values that all of us hold here are embraced. We need a Europe that focuses on a neighborhood policy that promotes a more stable environment for the troubled regions that surround us, because tackling the causes of instability is as important as tackling its effects. Reform of the Union is necessary. Time is of essence. What happens short-term defines the future of Europe. This is the time when all of us recognize what is at stake and rise to the occasion. We must summon the courage to review and change what is not working and to remove or improve stagnant concepts and thinking, we must use existing structures and operational methods that facilitate and deliver solutions and eliminate the bureaucracy that has blighted our citizens' perception of the Union. Only by redoubling our efforts to engage with our citizens, especially to bridge internal differences between member states, and only through shared solutions, we will manage to translate talk into action. The Rome Summit provides us with an ideal opportunity to focus on the EU's common interests and to focus on the theme of Malta's presidency reunion, which is all about moving forward together as independent nations in a united union. The debate on the union's future, which is an overarching priority of our presidency, needs to accelerate momentum by galvanizing and energizing our efforts to ensure the continuation of a viable European project. The white paper unveiled by the Commission President just a few days ago laid out the various options before us as we map the Union's future. Some are more attractive than others, but it is important for us to bear in mind that none is exclusive. I do not think that any of us want to return to a situation where the Union consists of nothing more than a single market, since that would mean giving up so many of the qualities that have made the Union what it is today. Taking this route could spark a dangerous race to the bottom. Complex and difficult as it might be, what is crucial is that we reach consensus on unifying factors that are effective, efficient and viable. It is a very delicate balancing act. We must also seek to ensure that the direction we take is robust, adaptable and sustainable. I do not think any of you need reminding that what we decide now will determine our coming future. Our priority is to ensure that we opt for a course of action that is embraced by Member States towards the long-term viable existence of the Union. The opportunity we have before us allows us to define the shape of the Union we want for our future generations to live in. As, and we do have hope, and we have hope because we believe in our European youth. There is an urgent need to make them feel once again part of the European project, part of its viable future. The challenge before us is to mould a Europe that is capable of delivering tangible results to its citizens. The EU can only remain a positive and relevant force in citizens' lives if it once again earns their trust. And it can only achieve this if it manages to provide them with value-added citizenship. 
giving greater importance to regional and local government is vital. For it is they, you, the people in this room, who are in touch with our citizens on a daily basis. We have an opportunity before us, an opportunity to make genuine progress during Malta's presidency, which is all about achieving real objectives. And I'm very hopeful that the Union will succeed if we adopt a bottom-up approach and if we act to instill a sense of faith and optimism in our citizens so that they all feel once again a sense of belonging to the European project. In the final analysis, it is up to us, all stakeholders, especially you, as leaders of our communities, to determine our own destiny. The buck stops with us. Success belongs to those who can anticipate, anticipate evolving scenarios, those who can forge a common denominator that unites and strengthens rather than divides and weakens. Thank you very much. Deputy Prime Minister, thank you very much indeed. You've honoured us with your presence here and your words are very inspiring as we look towards the next chapter uh, that we must all write together. Uh, for the final keynote speech of the day, we turn to the first Vice President of the European Commission. Please welcome to join us Mr Franz Timmermans. Thank you very much um, and thank you for having me. I'll, I'll try and be as um, stimulating or provocative as I can in the presence of so many people from so many cities across Europe because I believe we, we face a couple of co common challenges and we need to try and find common solutions. It's going to be tough enough, I think, in the next generation uh, to do that. To me, the confrontation we see across Europe now is an ideological one. It's two fundamentally different visions of our society colliding. One vision that says both visions want to offer optimism and a sense of direction and protection, which I think most of our citizens are craving for today. One of the solutions that is now presented in quite a number of our member states and other states is to say we will protect by closing down, by building walls, by seeking protection with those who are like us. And looking for danger in those who are not like us. It's a very popular way of looking at things. What I dismiss is this ideology. What I don't dismiss is the sentiment of needing to feel protected and cared for that is behind it. And I think that one of the things we need to do is to be very careful to distinguish these two when we discuss this issue. The other vision wanting to seek optimism, is an optimism based on diversity, on the clash of opinions, a clash of differences, on seeing differences as a source of force, as a source of creativity, which is a much more difficult proposition in times of pessimism, but which I think is a proposition worth fighting for. And this brings me to, to the cities immediately. This confrontation I was talking about in quite a number of our member states is also a confrontation between cities and rural areas. Uh, it was mentioned just when I uh, came in uh, that, for instance, uh, the highest level of anxiety about diversity is in areas where there is no diversity. The lowest level of anxiety for diversity is in areas with high levels of diversity. Very interesting paradox. And of course, cities are, high, are areas of high diversity, by definition, through the ages, and certainly today. But if we, and we, we can, I don't want to be too specific, but I have to deal with some issues which are related with that in the European Union. If we let this confrontation get out of hand, and you create an opposition between cities and rural areas based on the feeling that the ones are being accommodated and the others have been left behind, you create a political divide in member states and in societies that is then becomes very difficult to bridge in the mid and longer term. So my first point for discussion perhaps or reflection today, if you want to do something long term 
for cities, cities will need to understand that they will also need to feel responsibility for the development in rural areas. You cannot look at the development of cities in isolation of the development of rural areas and vice versa. That would be my, my first point. And why not, why not choose for the adoption by cities of specific rural areas uh, to create, to create um, a, a dynamic relationship? I have some examples of that in, in the country I know best, and it works quite well on both sides because it, 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 cre it creates a dynamic relationship which brings a bit of optimism also in, in rural areas where, where optimism is, is very often very difficult to find. This becomes even ever more important if we look at what the effects are going to be of the fourth industrial revolution. Which are the parts of the world that are going to be most successful in reaping the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution? I think those areas where creativity is at its best. Because the fourth industrial revolution will no longer be about bulk production, about the existing economic model. The fourth industrial revolution will be about how you uh, invent new solutions to new problems and new solutions to old problems, and how quickly you can translate these solutions into practical products or services. That is, I think, in essence, uh, what uh, we will need uh, to do, and we will need to do it in a sustainable way. No longer depleting their resources, recycling what we have, and using the digital uh, uh, instruments we have to make this work better. And this, of course, is first and foremost going to happen in cities. It's not going to happen in rural areas. So that's why we at the Commission believe strongly that we need to find a couple of partners, cities across the European Union, to try and quickly uh, install 5G. Because if you're able to install 5G in cities, you will be able to change the paradigms of mobility in those cities, which will create huge, uh, a huge dynamic development for the fourth industrial revolution. But if we do that, we should, from the outset, try and combine that with something that helps rural areas at the same time. And I think specifically, if you want to have a sustainable development, also in terms of the need for food and food products and water and clean water, there is a potential for uh, a, a joint approach between rural areas and city, w cities, which I think is, is, is enormous. Enormous. Um, so these are a number of the issues where I believe um, this dynamic relationship between cities and rural areas could profit the whole of society. Now, of course I've been looking also at the country I know best in the last couple of weeks and months and looking at the electoral campaign, which is the, the most surprising, let me put it in a neutral term, electoral campaign I've ever experienced in my political life. Um, uh, because the country, of course, is in complete shambles, as you understand. It's, it's got 5% unemployment, it's got no budget deficit, it's got, um, uh, it's got a, even a small surplus this year. It's, it's, it's uh, got 2.345% uh, economic growth uh, this year. So, as you can understand, it really is in deep, deep trouble. Uh, but this is, the, this is the feeling some people have. Why? Because we have the feeling that we, have, we are well off. But there's two things. We as individuals are well off, but we as society are not. That's the first point. And the second point is, we are well off today, but we'll be, excuse my French, screwed tomorrow. And this is essentially what the political debate is about, I think, not just in the Netherlands, but in quite a, a number of uh, European, highly developed European societies. Now, I think to come out of that, we need a bit of optimism, more than we had before. In many of our cities, especially the biggest cities, optimism is so self-evident that we don't even talk about it anymore, and it's difficult for the city dwellers in those cities to understand that others are not as optimistic as they are, and, and to relate to that feeling is becoming more difficult. So we also have this divide in society also becomes a bigger divide once we enclose ourselves in, into an environment where, with people with whom we already agree. This is another element in politics that we see uh, coming back. Now, another issue I haven't addressed yet, which I will briefly address, which some, very often is associated with um, 
with cities is the issue of diversity, ethnic diversity, etc. Uh, I think here, cities are more optimistic than rural areas, but cities sometimes also have much bigger challenges than rural areas. In too many countries, we see that social mobility is not increasing but decreasing. And I think cities have huge potential to break that mold, which is becoming the standard mold. There is too much, the field, there's too many ideas across Europe saying social mobility was a success of our parents and grandparents, but now everybody who could be social mobile has been mobilized socially, and so we have to uh, 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 accept that those who are not, uh, who are down there will stay down there and the only thing we can do is provide a level of comfort for them. I would absolutely take issue with that, with that assumption. And we have daily proof in cities which are ethnically diverse that this does not need to be the case. The biggest um, successes of social mobility are within our minorities, which is a social mobility I'm, I'm, I'm from a very, very social, mobile, very mobile uh, background. Um, I was the first in, in, in my family history ever to go to secondary education, let alone university education. But my, my people took three generations to get there. And now you can see it happen in cities in a generation. I have many friends whose parents are literally illiterate. But they have two university degrees, and this happened in one generation. And we don't see it. We don't, we, don't, we don't create examples of that. We don't create a positive narrative around that. And we, we associate all minorities with one religion or with uh, uh, jihadism or whatever. Um, a touch of realism and a touch of optimism, sharing experiences across cities, between cities, and then also sharing it with rural areas is something I hope we as Commission can also contribute to in exchanging information with you. The whole idea of European integration from the outset, after the Second World War, was to create inter interdependency between nations. But then the first policies that came about were exactly about what I was talking about earlier. We had free trade ideas, fr free exchange of goods ideas, was based on the fact that the cities could not offer enough jobs and enough uh, development for the population. The European, the common agricultural policy was to prevent, especially the French rural areas, from dying out completely. So from the outset, Europe has always been about creating a balance between the interests of cities and the interests of rural areas. We've sort of forgotten about that. And I think we need to reinvent that if we want to have a successful urban uh, policy in the future. Urban policy is about cities and rural areas. It cannot be divided. If we divide it, we will be, we'll fail on both fronts. And we will create such big divides within our society, people who don't even understand each other's problems anymore because they live in completely different worlds. And this is, this is, I would say, arguably our biggest challenge today, to avoid us becoming citizens of the same nation living in two different worlds if we live in cities or if we live in rural areas. I think this is, this is to, to me, is, is one of the, the biggest challenges which we can overcome. I'm, I'm optimistic about this. Essential for creating more social mobility, I think, will be education. Education, we will have to spend, and I'm not saying this you know, as an official commission position, my personal view is we will have to come to terms with the fact that we will have to spend more of our wealth on education than we are spending now. It is unavoidable. And this will be lifelong learning, not just letting young uh, people go through school and then that's it. And there again, this needs to be done in cities, in cooperation also with rural areas, but it, it starts in, in, in cities. And to create dynamic forms of education, which is going to educational facility, but also using the 5G network to do a lot of things at home, uh, uh, also uh, changing the nature of mobility, which is going to be an incredible source of, of economic growth, I believe, etc., etc., things I was talking about before. Education is going to be central to recreate the feeling that social mobility is possible. Um, and let me end on this. There is almost uh, an endless source of optimism in your cities. 
with all the problems you may have, social inclusion problems, uh, congestion problems, waste management problems, sanitation problems, I know all the problems. Integration problems, I know all, all of them. But if I look back at my own experience over the last 30 years, and the, most of the cities I know, many of whom are, are represented here around the table, let's be honest about the fact that all these cities are in such a better shape now than they were 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, it's almost uncomparable. And let's use that as a source of optimism instead of letting ourselves be drawn back in this pessimism. We have a lot to look forward to. And if we work together better, if we share experience better, if we create these uh, alliances better within societies and between societies, I think we can be extremely successful. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Mr. Vice President, uh, a wonderful vision and a great uh, final speech to, to end this summit of European mayors. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the concluding sequence goes like this. In about seven minutes, I'm going to ask the Vice President and the Deputy Prime Minister, along with our Vice President and President, to stand here in front of you, everyone else to stand up, and then the photographer will take a big photo to, 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 to end the show. Between now and then, you have a quick summary from me and then a conclusion from Karen uh, on today's events. So uh, my quick summary would go like this. We spoke this morning about the challenges, and we mentioned the different difference between populism and Euroscepticism. We talked about the role of cities in terms of how citizens belong. We spoke about the need for a more confident and stronger EU. We talked about processes of reform that brought together economy and security with solidarity. And then we talked about long-term thinking sequenced with short-term leadership and action. This afternoon, we've spoken about six more topics. The first one is the information, communications, and technology revolution, the power that it has both to promote uh, social mobility and productivity, but in particular, as Karin said, the power of this revolution to forge a new set of communication tools between citizens and uh, our civic society, local governments, and others. The second theme has been the theme of dialogue, uh, a different kind of imagination, a civic imagination that underpins that dialogue, a dialogue that's rooted in diversity and purpose. The third theme has been one of major reforms in co-creation, and uh, we were led into this by Karin and then by the Mayor of Rotterdam. We've talked about open dialoguing, participatory budgeting, voting on projects, tactical urbanism, citizen-led services, citizen councils, various kinds of democratic renewal. We've talked about migrant and diverse participation in democracy. We've talked about building a new generation of city makers and facilitators. The fourth theme has been one about EU reforms, and it's been saying that these EU reforms could be based on some of the best innovations coming from democratic renewal within our cities. In other words, citizen participation and open democracy in a more tactical uh, approach by Europe to delivering its promise. The fifth theme has been the future of Europe, where a number of people have said, we want a sixth scenario, if we may, a sixth scenario that's rooted in the values of Europe, the values of uh, cohesion, of, of optimism, transparency, interdependency of nations, free trade, a security and solidarity, diversity as a strength, memory but not nostalgia, a focus on uh, 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 appropriate levels of regulation, cultural creation and production, sustainability, many other things mentioned by many people as a core set of values around which they'd like to to see the future of Europe debated. And then the sixth point we've talked about a lot was good governance. Reforms that uh, embolden transparency, create greater honesty, reduce waste in the way that public funds and public resources are managed, and provide, as it were, more flexibility and earned autonomy to uh, local and other leaders who demonstrate the ability to take a lead in this citizen-led, citizen-based approach. That, I think, has been the main summary of what the t more than 20 mayors have said today and our keynote speakers have added. And now I ask the Vice President of EuroCities to give her conclusions and then to close the summit. Thank you.